This is the Church of St. Paul in the Desert. In the name of God, source of all being, incarnate word, and Holy Spirit. So today we arrive now at the third Sunday of Advent in our journey toward the Christmas feast, sometimes known as Gaudete Sunday from the word rejoice, which was the epistle for many, many hundreds of years in the Western Mass. And today we rejoice, and that's why, by the way, we have a pink candle finally lit. And it's a perfectly appropriate day to do lessons and carols. And um, my salute and thanksgiving to you, Nathan, and to the choir for your special gifts that you've offered today as part of our Advent journey. I thank you very much. It was beautiful. And indeed, all of that fits with a special sort of lifting up of the penitential side of Advent, uh, which is part of the tradition here, kind of anticipating joyfully that which is to come. So lightening up a little bit, rejoice, anticipatory joy. And as part of our unique celebration today, we're eliminating the creed and the confession and moving right along into prayers in the Eucharist. All of this doesn't fit all that well with John the Baptist, <laughs> who continues to be the primary figure in the second and third Sundays of Advent. Uh, I can't help but note Father Heber's uh, comment last Sunday when he was preaching about the teaching of John, who said things like, you brood of vipers who've warned you to flee from the wrath to come, and Merry Christmas to you too. I really like that one a lot. I, I appreciated that. John is a rough character. He doesn't tell things that we want to hear necessarily. You know, he's not the person you'd probably invite for Christmas dinner. Uh, and I know some of you will remember that, uh, that uh, John the Baptist story about the Sunday school teacher who was explaining to her all the children in the Sunday school about who John was. And he was a rough character and he had a long beard and he lived out in the desert and he had a camel hair coat and he had a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And one of the younger kids raised her hand uh, and asked the teacher, what's a locust? And the teacher explained, well, a locust is kind of like a grasshopper. And all bunch of those kids went, oh, yuck, he ate grasshoppers? Ew, yuck. At which point one of the older boys piped up and said, that's nothing, my grandmother drinks them. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had a grasshopper, <laughs> but it's an appropriate image for John the Baptist. Kind of yuck. <laughs> but today we focus a little differently and note the place of John in the whole story of salvation. And he occupies a very unique place. Indeed, Jesus says, of those born of women, no one is greater than John. And yet, he is the least in the kingdom of heaven. Well, I think that refers to the fact that John is the last of the great prophets, the last of the prophetic tradition, of which we just heard a whole lot of words in our service of lessons and carols from those persons. John is the ultimate and final expression of the old covenant preparing the way. He is the greatest prophet bar none. And yet at the same time, he is not part of the new dispensation, the new covenant that's about to dawn. He looks over the edge, over the abyss, and he sees and announces and proclaims what is now being dawned, what is being birthed in the story of history and of salvation of Christ, but he's not really a part of it. His job was to announce it, make it happen, transfer, note the change, but he himself must now fade. And indeed, in the Gospel of John, he has to explain to his followers that it's his time to decrease as Jesus increases. The incredible piece of artwork, for those of you who like art, uh, the uh, artist Grunewald, who had a particular style of vivid sort of painting of religious figures, uh, did the Eisenheim Frontal, which is an altarpiece in a museum over in Europe, it's a very distinct piece of art, and it shows Jesus dying on the cross in the middle. And over to one side, you have Mary and the women looking on. 
And on the other side, you have John the Baptist pointing, and in Grunewald's style, he has a big, big index finger, and it sort of looks like this, and he's pointing to Jesus dying on the cross. Now, historically, that's inaccurate. John was dead by the time Jesus is dying. But theologically, it is profoundly true, because that was John's role. This is the one, not me. Indeed, uh, there is in the Gospels a reflection of that tension between the followers of John, a very charismatic figure, and switching gears over to Jesus, the, the new one who is coming. It's interesting to me that there is a religious community uh, that still exists today that follows John the Baptist, the Mandeans. They are native to the Middle East, though many now have migrated out because of the violence there. Some now live in the United States, and the Mandeans, their prophet, their founder, is John the Baptist. They don't say he's divine, but the, he's their founding prophet, which suggests something that even in modern times, a reflection of that little tension of switching gears. That's what transitions are all about. As we move from one leader or one figure to another, be it a commander, a school principal, a teacher, our favorite doctor, and yes, rectors and vicars and pastors. And that's exactly where we are as a parish now, in that time of transition, shifting gears from a long and fruitful pastorate of one particular person, and now moving toward the day when we will call a new person to fill that role. And that transition can be difficult. There are lots of horror stories out there of churches that didn't do it well and blew it, and the next pastor wasn't so successful. That's why the transition issues are so important and that we take our time to do it well so that all are victorious. And not only thanksgiving for the old, but also welcoming the new. And that's where we are as a parish. Well, today we get a different picture of John, not now the preaching so much, but his own position, and here he is now in jail. Depressed, anxious, and wondering, is this for real? Did I waste my time? Are you really the one who is to come? Was it really worth it? Because jails are lousy places to be, even in our own time, and they're really lousy in the ancient world. And John knows that this is not going to come out well. And he's anxious. Perhaps we can understand that. I think sitting in jail and rotting away would make me filled with doubts and anxieties and questions. Is it worth it? It's also possible that John's image of Messiah was very different from what he was hearing about Jesus. Maybe he expected a militaristic kind of guy who would wipe out the Romans, or some pure kind of priest who would go in and clean out the temple and make it pure again, revise the liturgy. We don't know, but John is anxious. And John sends disciples to ask, are you the one? Jesus' response is not direct, typical of Jesus. He wants us to think for ourselves and decide for ourselves. And so he says to those representatives, go and tell John this. Tell what you see and hear. The blind are beginning to see. The deaf are beginning to hear. The dumb are beginning to speak. Lepers are being cleansed. The dead are being raised. And poor people who have had no hope are hearing good news for the first time. Go tell John that. That's my answer. It might seem rather oblique to us, but it may not have been quite as oblique as we see it because in the, one of the readings we just heard read uh, that we did a group reading on was Isaiah 35, the desert rejoicing and blossoming as the rose. Great text for a parish church in the desert. And in that lesson, we're describing, the prophet's describing, the return from exile of, these, of the Jewish people who have been cast off into Babylon, Iraq to us. And they've been granted the passage to come home, a new exodus, a new journey. And the signs that God is involved in this and that God is engineering this and that God is with his people and he's bringing them home, the signs are precisely you guessed it, 
The dumb speak, the deaf hear, the blind see, lepers are cleansed, deers leap, and the poor have good news for the first time again. Those are official signs that God is in the midst of this and he's messing around with us again and he's very much present. <clears throat> That's the real meaning, by the way, of miracles in the Bible. It isn't so much that a miracle happened. That's great. They are signs of something huge and big. It's special code. And I think John the Baptist probably was able to read that code and know what Jesus meant. Well, it's, it's even a literary connection. The Greek word for a deaf person or a person with ear trouble is megalalos. And that Greek word, which is in the Matthew version in Greek, is exactly the same word in Greek in the Old Testament version of the Bible, the exact same word. So there's even a literary connection between the two. The questions that they ask for John are the questions we ask in our time. Is Jesus the one who is to come? Do we look for another? We live in a world that is not terribly religious as we might think, at least in traditional terms. Is Jesus really the one? Is he a nice guy? Cool cat, great teacher, model, contemplative example. Hey, we got Confucius, we got Buddha, we got all kinds of people. Is he the one? The nuns or the knowns in polls that ask people their religious affiliation, N-O-N-E, that number is rising all the time in our culture. People are wondering, and maybe some people even in church perhaps wonder, is it all worth it? Is he just a nice guy? Well, Jesus gives an oblique answer to John, and in a way it's an oblique answer to us. It's not God's nature to force people to believe or to jam you up against the wall and say, you'd better believe or else. That's not God's way. And you can know you're in spiritual pathology when people who call themselves religious try to pull that on other people. That's not the way of Jesus. So we have to answer to the same question. What do we see? What do we hear? Every time, for example, when Habitat for Humanity builds a house for a family who can't afford to buy a house, Every time Doctors Without Borders go across another boundary to give medical care to those who have no access to medical care, sometimes at great personal risk. Every time Amnesty International manages to free a prisoner because of political or religious affiliations anywhere in the globe or because they've been tortured. Every time someone like the gentleman several weeks ago who walked across the courtroom to embrace and forgive the very woman who had just killed and been convicted for killing his own brother. Every time we see things like firemen going up twin towers not knowing what will happen. Every time you walked away from a relationship or an experience where you felt loved and cared about and someone made you feel like life was worth it and that there was joy in life again, when you felt that way, and every time people like you and I get together in a building like this, and thousands and millions of thousands of our brothers and sisters across the globe who are doing this today, passing the peace to one another, breaking bread, all these things are signs right in our midst. And yes, a Martian looking down could say, well, I guess there's just a lot of nice people on planet Earth. It's possible to miss it. That's true. But for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, they are signs that God is in our midst after all, and that business about him coming again is not just a pipe dream. It's based in reality and real experience. And you and I, as people of the Word, of faith, of Eucharist, of love, we know how to read the code. So we rejoice. And I'm looking forward to seeing you 
at our Christmas Eve services and on Christmas Day. Amen.